PowerShell is a really powerful tool, no pun intended, for administering our computers and our networks, and there are a ton of commandlets that we can use, but there are certain ones that I seem to find myself using all the time. Stay tuned, and I'm gonna show you my top five PowerShell commandlets. Welcome everybody, I'm getting ready to share with you my top five PowerShell commandlets, but before I do, make sure you click on that subscribe button down below so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming videos. Now, before we get started, I wanna put a little asterisk out here, right? Because some of you are gonna say, wait a second, you forgot this command or that command, how could you leave those out of your list? And there are some commands that I see on everybody's list, like get help and get dash command, very important commandlets for us to know, especially as we're getting started uh, learning PowerShell. But in this list, I really wanted to focus on some of the commandlets that I find useful in my everyday duties, and I think that maybe go unnoticed or are not used as much, or people don't realize how cool they are or how much, how useful they can be. All right, so let's start. Number one, we're gonna start off with a commandlet known as test-path. Now test-path, or test path for short, is a commandlet that we can use to verify whether or not something exists, typically a file, right? So if I wanna verify that a file exists, I can do test-path, and then I can put in the path to that file. All right, so let me show you what I mean. In its simplest form, test-path will let me test whether or not an object exists, like a file. So I'm gonna put in a test-path and then my path to the file. I got a file called test.txt. We're going to check for, and notice it returns true because that file does exist. Now if that file didn't exist, it's going to return false. So let me put a file name that doesn't exist, and there we can see we actually end up returning false. All right. Now you might think, well, Mike, that doesn't seem all that useful, but when you start writing scripts and these scripts have multiple commands in them and lots of things that they need to do, any error along the way causes the entire script to fail. So let's say I was trying to append to the end of a log file, for example, or, or something like that, or create a file, but if the file already exists, it's going to throw an error. For example, let me jump over here. Rather than make you uh, watch me type, I'm going to copy some of these commands and I'll explain what they're doing here. So I'm going to paste this one, and this is simply a new dash item command, creates a new item, item type file, and then the name of the file and the path that I want to create. When I hit enter, you'll see I get an error message. It says, hey, this file already exists. And while that might not seem like a big deal, if this command was buried inside a complex script, that entire script just failed. So I can use test-path to verify before I run this part of the script whether or not that file already exists. Let me show you. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna grab this next command. And it looks scary, maybe, but it's not too bad. I'm gonna paste this in here. Basically, it's saying if, and I'm checking to see whether or not, and there's my test-path command, right? I'm checking to see whether or not this file exists. Now, I'm using an exclamation in front of it, which turns it into a not. So if this file doesn't exist, do this, right? And you can see new item, file type, file, and then test.txt. Well, we know that that file already exists, so if I run this, you might expect it to throw an error. But let me run it. Notice I didn't get an error because it's saying, hey, you had me check first to see whether it exists. It does, so I'm not gonna do anything else. So that's one of the ways we can use test-path, but that's not the only thing it can do. This is where it gets really cool. It can do even more. Let's take a look at another one. I'm gonna flip back over to my document here and grab this next command. Yes, it can check for paths to files. It can also check registry paths, all right? So here, I'm checking to see whether or not this particular registry key exists. So I'll hit enter and notice it returns true just like it did for that file. So if I'm trying to write a script that's going to create a registry entry or update an existing registry value, I can now verify whether or not that registry key exists first, create it if I need to, and then update the value. So I can eliminate those errors in my script if by chance that key or that value had already existed. But wait, there's more. Let me show you one more cool thing you can do with test-path. The last one I want to show you actually checks. There's a parameter that you can use along with test-path called newer than. I'll zoom in. I know it's hard to see it when I highlight it there. Uh, so let me get away from it, zoom back in, and then show you right there. Dash newer than, and then notice I put a date out next to that. 
All right. So what it's saying is test-path and then the path to a particular file, in this case, the executable for PowerShell. And then I want to know, is it newer than, and then the date that I typed in. So I'm going to hit enter, and notice it says true. Yeah, I'll zoom in so you can see that right down there. So it's validating that the PowerShell uh, file, that particular ex executable, has a creation date that's later than 2019, uh, July 24, 2019 in this case. I'm going to clear up my screen, and let's do another one. I'm going to change that to 2029, right? So is it newer than July 24, 2029? I hit enter, and notice it says false, because obviously it's not created in the future. So there you go, several different ways that I can use one of my favorite commands, test-path. All right, number two on my list is a simple one, but a very important one, get-execution-policy. As we get more proficient with our PowerShell commandlets, we're going to start creating scripts to automate things, and the execution policy on each machine controls whether or not scripts are allowed to be executed. And there's several different settings we can use for it. I'll show you here right now. So join me on my screen. The command is git dash execution policy. And I hit enter, and it returns what my current execution policy is. And you can see if I can highlight that there. Currently, it's set to remote sign, all right? What that means is local scripts will be able to execute no problem, but if they're remote, if I've downloaded them from somewhere else, they need to be digitally signed to verify the identity and integrity of those scripts. So this is a pretty safe setting. But by default, our Windows 10 client machines are going to be blocked. They're not going to allow scripts to be run. So as you start getting better and you're trying to write these scripts and run them, they keep failing. Why won't it let you run them? Because your execution policy is not set correctly. Or maybe you're working remotely with another machine and you don't know what their policy is set to. You can use this command to get that setting. All right. So get dash execution policy will let you return the current execution policy. Now, what if it's not the way you need it? You can use the set-execution policy, so a little bonus commandlet here, right? Uh, we're going to change my git to set-execution policy. And then you would do dash execution policy, and I'm going to hit tab, and you'll see that it cycles through all the different possible values for the execution policy. So if you want to set that to restricted, which is blocking all uh, scripts, Change that to unrestricted. Don't do that. That allows all scripts, where no matter where they came from, all right, all signed, even local scripts would have to be signed. Bypass lets you temporarily bypass your execution policy. Default just defaults to, like, for Windows 10, uh, it would be restricted. For Windows Server 2019, I believe it's, it's remote signed would be the default. But it just sets it back to whatever the default is. The point is, is you can change your execution policy. Now, I don't want to change mine. I'm going to leave it on remote signed. But another one of those commands that I find very, very useful, especially when I'm working with machines that I'm not familiar with, I need to know what their execution policy is, and I need to be able to change it so that I can run my scripts. All right, number three on my top five list is going to be git-credential. Now, this is one I find myself using all of the time because when we're working with PowerShell, and especially when we're working with remote machines, machines that are part of another domain, or if my laptop, for example, in, in my case, it's not part of my work domain. And so when I connect to these other machines using PowerShell, I need to provide credentials. I need to provide a username and a password. Get credential allows me to enter in a username and password and store it as an object. And then I can use that object as I execute other commands. I don't have to continue to type in my username and password every time. Really, really handy. All right, so let's see how it works. Get dash credential. All right, if I hit enter, it's going to prompt me for a username. So I would enter in my username. In this case, demo is the name of my domain. Uh, and then Mike is my username. I hit enter. And then my password. And I'll type it in. And I'll hit enter. And notice it stores that. And notice you cannot see the password either. It stores it as a secure string. All right, now, 
that might seem really cool, but here's the problem. Because I didn't store that anywhere, I simply ran the command, it's not really usable. So we're gonna add a little bit to this to make it more useful, and then we'll see how it works as we work our way down that top five list. I'm gonna throw in a bonus command. Most of you should know this by now, uh, but I'm at the bottom of my screen, my PowerShell window. I really like working at the top, makes it easier for you all to see as well. Clear screen, and the alias for that is CLS, and that clears all that stuff on my screen and puts me back to the top. So a little bonus one for you. We won't count that in the top five. All right, so to make git dash credential a little more useful, what I wanna do is I wanna create a variable, all right? And I'm gonna call it dollar sign creds. You could name it whatever you want. And I say equals and then git dash credential. So same commandlet, right? Now when I hit enter, it works the same way. I type in demo slash mic, and then I type in my password and I hit enter, it doesn't look like anything changed, right? But notice I didn't get the output this time. It didn't show me the username and the secure string because instead it stored that in that variable dollar sign creds. Now, anytime I wanna use that username and password, I can simply type dollar sign creds and it will pull that back. And that's gonna come into, uh, that's gonna be really, really handy as we work our way down to the next commandlet. Commandlet number four, I use all of the time. Invoke dash command. Invoke dash command is a way that I can execute PowerShell commands and PowerShell scripts against remote machines. I spend my time working on my laptop, but I administer servers and other client machines across my network, and I need to be able to execute PowerShell commandlets against them. Invoke dash command is one of the ways I can do that. And when I combine invoke dash command and invoke dash command with the number three command that I shared with you, git dash credential, it becomes a really, really powerful tool. Let me show you what I mean. All right, I'm gonna clear up my screen using that handy dandy alias uh, CLS, if I can type. It's tricky to type CLS. Uh, and let's do one, in fact, I'm going to copy this one because I don't want you to watch me type. All right, I'm gonna copy that out and we will paste it in here. And so what this is doing is invoke dash command, that's the name of the commandlet, and then the com dash computer name, and the name of the computer I wanna execute this command against. So whatever command I type in, don't run it against my laptop, run it against, in this case, server 01. Now server 01 is a different machine and my local account here doesn't have permissions to run commandlets on that other machine, server 01. So dash credential, and then it would normally prompt me for a username and password. But remember, we ran the git dash credential and stored it in a variable called dollar sign creds. So instead of it prompting, I can just provide that. I think I called it creds, not creds. So I'll make sure I've got my, there's my S. It's wrapping around the end of the screen. Hopefully you can see that there, all right? And then dash script block, and then I've got the curly braces, whatever we wanna call those guys, and git dash execution policy. So that's the command. So it's dash script block, open curly brace, command you wanna run against the remote machine, and then close curly brace, all right? So let's see if this works. I'm gonna hit enter, and there we go. Notice it tells me, okay, you're looking at server 01, that remote computer that's over there, it's actually a virtual machine uh, running in our server closet, and there is the execution policy for server one, remote signed. How about that, right? Allows me to run those PowerShell commands against remote machines, very, very cool. All right, now, not only can I run individual commands, right, and we could change that command up, like what if I wanted to say git dash I don't know, a net IP address or something like that, all right? Same thing, it's pulling this information. Let me scroll back up so you can find it, all right? This is server 01 and I'll find his IP address up there. There is his local, or excuse me, there's his local IP address, right? So again, you're seeing me fire commands against remote machines. Even more powerful is running entire scripts. What if I have a script on my laptop that executes several commands and I want to run that entire script against that remote machine? I can do that with invoke dash command, all right? So let's try that again. I'm gonna copy this and these commands are available for you guys. If you look right under the video down here, uh, show more and you'll see where we've included all of this for you so you can try it out yourself. So I'm gonna copy that out. I'm gonna flip back over to my PowerShell. I'm gonna paste that in. Very similar, right? Invoke dash command, 
dash computer name, server01, dash credentials, and then dollar sign creds. And then instead of a script block, now I have dollar or dash file path. And I'm pointing it to where that script that I want to execute is located. In my case, e colon backslash scripts backslash, and I named it demo.ps1. It would be whatever, if you're going to use this, either create that path or adjust that path to fit your needs, right? And I'm going to go ahead and run that. And there we go. This particular script runs a git dash culture, which shows you what your keyboard layout is and your uh, uh, display language. And notice it says English ENUS for server 01. So it's again, pulling back information from that remote computer. So that's how we can use that invoke command to fire PowerShell commands and even entire scripts against remote machines. All right, number five in my list is going to be enter-ps session. And this kind of builds on that previous commandlet, invoke-command. Invoke-command is really good at allowing me to execute a single command against a remote machine. But every command that I want to execute against that remote machine, I've got to type invoke-command, dash computer name, dash credentials, right? I have to provide that for every single one. So if I just have a, a single commandlet to, to execute, invoke-command works really well. But if I have a lot of command lists that I need to execute against the remote machine, I'm better off using enter-ps session. This is a lot like remote desktop, but for PowerShell. It allows me to connect to a PowerShell window on the remote machine. And then once I'm connected to that, everything I type is executed against the remote machine. But I don't have to tell it invoke command every time. I don't have to tell it the name of the computer every single time. Let me show you what I mean. So the command is gonna be enter, dash ps session the name of the computer that you want to establish the session with in my case that's going to be computer name uh, svr01 and then the credentials right the username and password for somebody that has permissions to connect to that remote machine now remember our, our number three i think it was in the list get dash credential now you're seeing why i find that one so useful because we're going to use it again here and use that dollar sign creds where i've already stored my username and my password so we hit enter, and there we go. We are now connected. And you can see my prompt has changed. Before I ran that commandlet, I was Mike at itpro.tv. But now that I've run the commandlet, my prompt says server01. So that's letting me know, hey, you are now connected to server1, and anything you type is going to be executed against server1. Let me show you. If I type in host name, right, it doesn't return the name of my laptop. Oops, as I cross it out there, uh, it returns server one, right? Because I'm, ex I'm executing this against that remote machine. If I type in, I don't know, git dash execution policy, right? It returns the execution policy, not of my laptop, but of the remote machine. And notice I'm not typing invoke command every time. I'm not having to specify the name of the remote computer or provide credentials every time. I've established this connection and now everything is being run across that connection. The only thing left to do, so if you have multiple commands, this is fantastic. I use this all the time. The one thing I want you to remember with this one is disconnect when you're done, right? Don't leave that session open. Uh, even if you kill the window, right? If I close PowerShell, that session is technically still out there uh, and we want to do best practices and we want to kill our sessions when we're done. And to do that, it's going to be exit-ps session, all right? Easy enough. Don't have to provide any information. Just hit enter and I'm back to my normal prompt Mike at itpro.tv. So enter dash PS session to start that remote connection and then exit dash PS session to end that remote session. Okay, so those are my top five PowerShell commandlets that I find extremely useful and use all the time. How about you? Do you use these or do you have others that you prefer? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos and we'll see you next time.